get started uh, the next session. Uh, we have two talks back to back. Uh, the first by Raj Foss on uh, the multi way cut problem. Okay. Thank you for all for coming. So today I'm, I'll talk about a very nice uh, geometric problem, which is essentially simplex partitioning and its application to the multi-way cut problem. So uh, let's go over, go very quickly what the multi-way cut problem. So it's one of the one of the two natural extensions of mean ST cut. Um, so we get an underrated graph, and we have special vertices which are called terminals. So here they're deno denoted by colors. So we have the red terminal the blue one and the green one. And the goal is to find the least number of edges. Um, is the microphone working? Yes, it is working. So we want to find the least number of edges. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, the least number of edges that once you remove them, uh, you disconnect all pairs of terminals. Um, so an equivalent way of looking at the problem is kind of a labeling problem. So we want to color each of the non-terminal nodes, uh, for example, like this. And this gives us essentially uh, three pieces in this example because there are three terminals or equivalently three colors. And edges, so sorry, so we have the red piece that contains the red terminal, the blue piece that contains the blue terminal, and the green piece that contains the green terminal. And edges that have two endpoints with different colors, uh, for example, the dashed edges, are exactly the edges you remove. And notice, for example, that once you remove them, you've disconnected all pairs of terminals. Okay, so formally we get a graph G, a special subset of terminals T of K terminals, and the goal is to partition the vertices of the graph into K sets, let's call them S1 up to SK. The constraint we have is that the ith piece contains the ith terminal, and we want to minimize the number of edges that cross uh, between the different pieces. So as I mentioned, uh, if you have only two terminals, this problem is easy, it's just uh, mean SD cut. Um, so what is known about this problem? Um, so Dalaus et al. Uh, actually were the first to consider uh, the multi-way cut problem, and they actually gave a very simple and clean combinatorial approach for it. So for example, uh, let's say this is the instance we have, and here let's say we have five terminals. So uh, in order to, let's say, find a good multi-way cut here, so you compute for every terminal the mean cut that separates that terminal from all other terminals. So let's say SI is that mean uh, cut. Uh, so for example, let's say S3 is the mean cut that separates the red terminal from the rest, and so on. Uh, notice, for example, that there might be vertices here that do not belong to any mean cut, or for example, a vertex that belongs to more than one uh, mean cut. And then you just take the union of all edges in the boundary of these mean cuts, and that's your uh, solution. So uh, this is very easily, you can see that gives it, this gives a two approximation. Why? Uh, because if this is an optimal solution, which is an actual partitioning of the vertices uh, of, of V, uh, then obviously, for example, the cost of the red piece is at least as large as the mean cut that separates the red terminal from the rest, and so on. So you get that the cost of SI is at most the cost of the ith piece in opt. And if you sum over the cost of all pieces in opt, uh, this is exactly twice the value of the solution because you counted each twi edge twice. Uh, so this is a very simple and very clean uh, two approximation. And they also showed uh, that um, if you have three terminals or more, this problem is not, NP not only NP-hard, but also APX complete. Um, so this is uh, what was known for the problem for uh, quite some time, uh, until the work of uh, Kalinesco, Karloff, and Rabani, which uh, gave a completely different and also very elegant uh, view of the problem, which is more geometric in nature. Um, so they actually constructed a relaxation for the problem where uh, you assign for each vertex uh, a distribution over the colors or the terminals. So one obvious thing you want to require uh, or force here is that, for example, uh, the red terminal will always go to, will, also, will always get the color red. So if you have the k-dimensional simplex, or in this example, the three-dimensional simplex, so the red terminal will, will correspond to the probability of placing a probability of one over the red color and a probability of zero over all other colors. And the green terminal will correspond to placing a probability of one over the green color and zero over the rest, and so on. And every uh, non-terminal node is just placed somewhere inside the simplex. 
okay? And so this is a, a very simple embedding of the graph into the simplex where you force each terminal to go to a different corner of the simplex. The question is, um, how do you measure the quality of such an embedding? So obviously you want to look at distances of points uh, inside uh, the simplex, and this leads to the following uh, relaxation given by Kal Kalinesco, Karloff, and Rabani. So if delta k is the k-dimensional simplex, so it's a collection of all k-dimensional points in the positive orthant that their coordinates sum up to one. So the constraints we have, so here I'm going to a little bit abuse the notations and u is a vertex, but I'll also use u to denote the embedding of u inside the simplex. Uh, this will make life uh, much easier. Um, so the constraint we have is that every vertex is embedded somewhere inside the simplex, right? And also we uh, require that every terminal is actually embedded into a different corner of the simplex. And distances are measured according to L1 distances. And the reason you have a half here is just for aesthetic reasons, uh, because you want the distance between two terminals to be one and not two, okay? Um, so this is uh, the relaxation or the geometric relaxation. And an interesting question is, okay, so there are lots of works that actually deal with this relaxation and we'll go over some of them in a couple of minutes, but the question is, uh, is this relaxation the right approach uh, for this problem? Uh, so today uh, we know that assuming the unique games conjecture, this is actually the right way to approach the problem. So uh, it was proved by Manokaran et al. that assuming the unique games conjecture, any integrality gap for this LP uh, actually translates into hardness. Okay, so uh, for a very long time, the only integrality gap that was known was uh, eight over seven given by uh, Freund and Karloff. Uh, and very recently, uh, I think it was in last IPCO, uh, this was actually improved to uh, 1.2. So I uh, assume here that let's say the number of terminals uh, grows, so it's large. So this gives you a, a, an exact behavior, but we're more interested in the case where k is large. You have many terminals. Um, so now, uh, so this actually means that if you are interested in the multi-way cut problem, uh, unless you want to refute the unique, unique games conjecture, you should work with this, this relaxation, this geometric relaxation for the problem. So the question now is, uh, given an embedding into the simplex, how do you extract a partitioning of it, essentially a multi-way cut? And this uh, actually leads to a very nice geometric problem uh, which is at the heart of this talk and actually at the heart of any uh, algorithm uh, for multi-way cut. So the problem is the following. Uh, we have uh, the k-dimensional simplex. Again, I have uh, in the picture only the three-dimensional one. That was hard enough drawing this. Uh, the four-dimensional one drawing it was yeah, a little bit above my ab abilities. Um, so what you're interested in is actually find a distribution over partitions, right? So what is a partition? What is a valid partition in our case? So we want k pieces, s1 up to sk, and we want the ith corner of the simplex to belong to the ith piece, right? So this is what is stated here. And given the distribution, uh, we want that the probability of separating any two points in the simplex to be proportional to half the L1 distance between the points, which is the exact contribution of uh, the two points uh, in the relaxation, essentially their contribution to the objective function. Um, so for example, uh, let's say we have, this is one, let's say you have some way of sampling partitions with this property. So you can see, for example, this is a valid partition of the simplex, why? We have, so this is a three dimensional simplex, we have three pieces. The red piece contains the red corner, the green piece contains the green corner, and the blue piece contains the blue corner. So this is valid. And now let's say you have a distribution over this, and it's uh, a simple observation that just by linearity of expectation, if you have this type of distribution over partitions uh, with a parameter of alpha here, this gives you an alpha approximation for multi-way cut. So this is a very clean and elegant geometric question that is kind of independent of multi-way cut. It implies something, but I think it's actually a very beautiful question. It's not clear uh, 
what's the best alpha you can get here until this day. So it's not known what the right answer is. Um, and actually, uh, not surprisingly, all algorithms besides the greedy uh, combinatorial one of Dallas et al. that gives you two approximation, all of these algorithms actually work in this way. They find distribution over partitions of the simplex and try to find uh, the best uh, alpha there is. Um, so one thing that will be very convenient uh, during this talk is actually to uh, restrict our attention uh, to a very specific type of edges, or essentially uh, points uh, in the simplex. So without a uh, loss of generality, if you have two points and we want to, in the simplex, and we want to ask what's the probability that they're separated, essentially that each one belongs to a different color, uh, we can assume they're of this structure. So you have, let's say, U. So this is uh, one point in the simplex. So its neighbor, V, is obtained by moving an epsilon mass from coordinate J to coordinate I. So this is equivalent of subtracting epsilon from the J's coordinate and adding epsilon to the I's coordinate. And this can be assumed without loss of generality. I don't want to go into the exact details, um, but uh, this is essentially uh, a, an outcome from the fact that you use L1 distances. And Given such an edge, let's say we can call it an edge of type ij, we're interested in what is called the cut density. And this, essentially the cut density will determine the approximation factor or, or how good the partitioning of the simplex is. So what is the cut density? So assume you have an edge that, of this type that you, remo you moved one, an epsilon mass from the jth coordinate to the i, then if you assume that you can take epsilon to be as small as you like, and then you see what's the probability of separating such an edge uh, with respect to its contribution to the objective, and the contrib contribution is exactly half the L1 distance, which is epsilon in this case. So it's this limit where you take the probability divided by the contribution to the LP objective, which is epsilon. So we're interested in this uh, uh, parameter, which is called the cut density of uh, the simplex partitioning method. So now I'll describe actually so uh, two building blocks uh, that were used in several algorithms. Um, uh, so the first building block uh, actually uses uh, exponential clocks or competition between exponential clocks. So uh, this is the entire algorithm. So you choose for every color or every terminal an independent exponential clock. They need, just need to have the same rate. So let's say the rate is one, it doesn't really matter. And then if you're a point U in the simplex, you scale each of the exponential clocks by your value in that coordinate, and you pick the winning one. So essentially, uh, the i space is all the points in the simplex where the i coordinate scaled one. So these are also exponentials, and you just let them compete, and the minimal one wins. So how does this look uh, geometrically? So if this is the three-dimensional simplex, um, so consider the point of all the exponential clocks once we scaled them to be inside the simplex, so we just divided by uh, their sum. So let's say this is the point z. So the first uh, question uh, is how does this point, uh, how is it distributed? in the simplex, and the answer is that this is actually a uniform point inside the simplex. Um, and so for example, given, let's say, this realization of the uniform point, what is the partitioning of the simplex it induces? So it induces this partition, let's say, for the three-dimensional simplex. Um, so one way to view this, again, in the three-dimensional case, is that uh, take, for example, the red terminal, and draw a straight line that goes through the z and take this remainder and also uh, from the green terminal so you have this line you have this and from the blue one you will have this and this uh, dictates the boundaries between the pieces and now you can imagine the point z floating around essentially a uniform point inside the simplex. Um, an equivalent polyhedral view of this is you can ask given a fixed point u uh, where can z fall such that, let's say, u is red, or where can z fall such that u is blue, and so on? So the answer is this. I hope there's no one colorblind in the audience, uh, otherwise this will be a little bit hard to follow. Um, so if this is u, uh, you get this red area, 
And this is essentially where if Z falls here, then U is red. It goes to the red terminal. And uh, one way to view this is, so you know that if you take all the K corners, or in, the, in this case, three corners of the simplex and take their convex all, that's the simplex itself. So if we're interested in the red color, remove the red corner of the simplex and add U instead and look at the convex hull of that. And that will be actually the area that if the uniform point falls there, then U will be colored red. Okay? So this is a nice interpretation of, uh, uh, of this method, but essentially this is the algorithm. These two, line, these two things here, that's the entire algorithm for K dimensions. And you can actually prove that the cup density uh, of let's say edge of type ij is at most two minus ui and uj, and remember that ui and uj are the values of the coordinates that changed, okay? Um, you can, we can also mention that uh, instead of using this algorithm, you can use uh, the algorithm of Kleinberg and Tardosh for uniform metric labeling. I don't want to go, in, I don't want to go into all the details, but for this purpose, it gives the exact same uh, cut density. Um, so the second building block was given by Kalinesco, Karloff, and Rabani. Uh, and what you do there uh, is you pick a random order over the colors. Let's call this permutation pi. And uh, you pick a random threshold, or you can think of it as a radius, almost like a radius uniformly between zero and one. And then you go over all the terminals in the order of the permutation, and you cut an L1 sphere around it with radius uh, one minus r. So this translates exactly to the following. So at the i-th step, if you look at all the unassigned points in the simplex and their value in that coordinate is at least uh, the radius, then you assign them to that uh, color. So let's say the permutation was one, two, three. Um, so let's say we chose a single radius. We got this piece. So this part of the simplex is red. And let's say now uh, we should have cut this, but this area was already red, so we get only what is uncolored will be green. And in the last step, in the kth step, actually everything that was uncolored, we just dump to the last color. So this will be colored blue. Okay, so this is uh, the second building block. And you can actually prove, so this is not exactly the way it was proved in the original paper, but this is what you can deduce uh, from their proof and their algorithm that if you have an edge of type ij that removed an epsilon mass from coordinate j to i, and also for without loss of generality, let's say we numbered the coordinates, so the first one is the largest, the second one is the second large, and so on. So the cut density is at most uh, one over i plus one over j, okay? Um, and this immediately, without anything, any extra things, gives you a one and a half approximation. And this is the one and a half approximation of what is called the CKR algorithm. Okay, because in the worst case, i equals one and j equals two, for example. So the question is, um, okay, so before we get to that, so uh, throughout the years, and we'll see in a second uh, what, what I mean throughout the years, we'll, there were many variations of the CKR algorithm, um, so the most Common, the most common of them was actually uh, when you distort the solution. So distorting the solution in this case, one way to do this is uh, one can ask, okay, why do I choose a threshold uniformly between zero and one? I can choose some distribution, and this perhaps might give me a better result. So changing the distribution where uh, that chooses the threshold R or the radius of the L1 sphere you cut is actually equivalent of distorting the solution, right? You apply some function G, on each of the coordinate, uh, coordinates and then just use uh, uniform radius r between zero and one. So this was uh, uh, extensively used and you can actually prove in this case uh, that the cut density, instead of being one over i plus one over j, becomes the derivative of g at the point ui, this is the value of the coordinate you change over i plus the derivative of g in the, uh, at uj divided by j, okay? And again, this is, uh, once you write the proof, it comes out very cleanly and almost immediately. So this is one variation that was used. And there were many others, for example, two variations that, were, that will be interesting uh, for today is one where you actually uh, say, okay, I don't choose a single radius, I choose each, for each uh, terminal or each color a radius independently. 
or I sort, for example, the radius, the radii I choose in a descending order, and that will dictate the order of the permutation and so on. So, for example, because you want the solution to be feasible, you want the terminal to always get its own color. So it means that g of 1 needs to go to 1, and also g of 0 needs to go to 0. But that's the only normalization uh, you need for g. But we'll get to things like this uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, so before we'll I'll slowly uh, explain to you what, what algorithms, what results are known, uh, and mainly with these building blocks, uh, and this will uh, lead us to the question or the I know uh, the new uh, thing I want to talk about today. Um, an obvious question is why do we need uh, so many building blocks? Why not just use this or that? So the answer is that um, each building block has a different bad case. So if you have two algorithms and each one performs well on one instance, one type of instances and performs badly on some other type of instances, and you have, say, algorithm number two, where these are actually reversed. So by combining the two algorithms, you might get something that is strictly better than each of those two separately. So I'll give you just a quick example. Um, so for example, if you take the first building blocks, the exponential clocks, and you choose it with probability two thirds, and you take the uh, CKR algorithm and you apply a quadratic distortion, it means that you just, uh, if you had a value x in some coordinate, you just look at x squared and you choose that with probability one third. Um, this, uh, from what we've, we've seen so far, actually immediately gives you an approximation of 4 over 3. Why? Because the cut density will be with probability two thirds the cut density of exponential clock, which is 2 minus ui minus uj, and with probability one third, you get the cut density of the CKR algorithm with a quadratic distortion, which is 2ui over i plus 2uj over j, and this is at most four thirds. All right, so this improves uh, CKR, for example, by using these building blocks. So what is known about this problem, and now that, that we're actually equipped with an understanding of, of what the two basic building blocks are, and we can actually understand what's, what's the state of the art or what's going on uh, with multi-way multi cut these days. So uh, as I mentioned, by the way, all these results uh, use the geometric relaxation and essentially find the distribution over partitions of the simplex uh, with uh, the lowest cut density that uh, they can. So th as I mentioned, there's a one and a half approximation by uh, Kalinesco, Kavos, and Rabban, and this is just by applying the, their algorithm. And there there was uh, the work of Cargo, Klein, Stein, Thorope, and Young, which actually combined uh, two building blocks, which is the secure algorithm where they had a distortion where you, they actually truncated the radius at some point. And they mixed it with uh, uh, the secure algorithm where you choose all the thresholds independently, and then they also had some truncation in the distribution there, and that, that gave them a guarantee of, or a cut density of 1.3438. Uh, I already mentioned the four-thirds al algorithm where you just mix the exponential clocks with the CKR and quadratic distortion. And then uh, there was the work of uh, Schama and Vondrak where they actually took uh, this approach and actually found uh, uh, the best way you can use it. So they, what does it mean the best way? So they actually uh, found a, a distortion which is piecewise quadratic that gives you 1.309, and they all, the remarkable thing that they also proved that you cannot do any better with this approach. So you cannot um, find any other distortion that actually gives you something uh, better than this. So now the question was, is this the right answer? Is this the best you can hope for? Um, so as a, I assume it's a proof of concept. They show that the answer is no. And you can get something which is slightly lower, 1.2965. Um, and you actually need to throw in many more building blocks. So you have these two that were before. And you also add uh, the case of the CKR algorithm with independent thresholds and the CKR algorithm with descending thresholds. And each of them is with some truncated distribution over the radius or the radii you choose. And this was almost proved uh, fully, but at some point in the end, they had to use uh, uh, a computer for their proof. But they actually proved that, assuming the computer, the number of the computer uh, uh, 
completely correct. They actually had a very fine research and they actually even, see, even analytically bounded the error. So this is, uh, you can actually say that this is fully proved. So the question is, and the interesting question, so we can see that this gets more and more complicated. Uh, so the answer is, is there a simpler approach? So I don't know what the right answer is, and it's still an open question, but an interesting question is, at least for now, is do we need all these building blocks, or is there uh, another way that we can approach the problem and perhaps get something uh, better or something simpler? So let's, uh, in the few minutes I have left, um, let's go back and look at what the distortion was, and this is exactly what Dipana asked me. Um, so we have G that goes from takes a coordinate and outputs the new value of the coordinate, right? So if we started with a point Q, so then after the distortion, we just apply G on each of the coordinates and w the value of one, G of one has to be one and G of zero has to be zero if we want the output to always be feasible. So for example, uh, if this is a simplex, if we take the quadratic distortion, means G of X equals X squared, this is how the simplex looks like. So it's not the simplex anymore and it is squeezed in towards the origin. So uh, one, thing, one thing that someone can do or, or try to do is actually uh, look at this in a, more, in a broader perspective. And what does it mean? So now if we have a point U in the simplex, uh, we don't want to treat every point separately. So every point in the simplex will now depend on everything else or, or essentially the entire point. So if I look at the first, first coordinate, I look essentially, I don't look only on its value, I look at all the values at u itself and then decide what will be the value of the first coordinate. And then to decide the value of the second coordinate, again I look at the entire of u, all the k values there, and decide what will be the second value of g after the transformation and so on. So for example, um, this is one transformation we use and I'll show you to you in a second, but intuitively in some sense this expresses dependencies uh, between uh, variables and actually the lower bound does not hold anymore. So I let's, mean, like, the, lower bound the, the Schalman von Dach lower bound that if you take that framework, oh, 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 oh. yes, yeah, so because that's a very specific distortion. It's a distortion that is applied coordinate wise for each of the coordinates. So the question is if you express dependencies or add dependencies in, in the transformation, can, is it a simpler way to go below that lower bound? And the answer is actually yes. Um, so now it seems very general, how do you construct such a distortion? So uh, as, we, as we said before, terminals need to be fixed points. Um, another thing that seems uh, reasonable to require, but it's not a necessity, is what you might call symmetry. So if we have two points U and V, and U is just obtained from V by permuting the coordinates, so changing the order. So we know that U goes somewhere here by this general transformation. And so intuitively we would like to require that you can uh, obtain V by just uh, transforming U and then permuting the coordinates in the same way. So this is not, a re so this, we require this, it's not a necessity, but it's something that seems reasonable to require from such transformation. Um, so one way to obtain this is the following, and this is actually the type of transformations we uh, restrict ourselves to. So you, given a point Q, we sort the coordinates, and then you apply some transformation on the largest value coordinate, and then a transformation on the second largest value coordinate, and so forth. And after you've done that, you place them back in their order, in their original order, and each of these up, uh, transformations might depend on all the values of that point, not the the uh, specific coordinate you're changing. And I won't go into the details, but we also want the transformation to be well defined in the sense that if you have uh, two coordinates with the same value, so let's say one of them is the largest, they're, both of them are the largest one, you don't want the value of the output to depend on how you break ties in the sorting. Right, so in that sense, uh, this is well defined and some monotonic conditions. Um, so this is, for example, a transformation. So this is the largest coordinate, the second largest, and so, so on, uh, that actually gives you uh, 17 over 13 as a proof of concept, that, and this is smaller than the lower bound. So now you don't need all these four building blocks. You just apply exponential clocks with some probability, and the CKR algorithm with this global distortion with dependencies, and you get something which is lower than the lower bound. 
uh, of Sharma and von Drack. And the main result is you can get uh, 1.2969 for uh, multi-wake using this approach, so only these two building blocks. And this is almost uh, what Sharma and von Drack uh, got up to the, you know. If we stopped calculating the number here, it will look the same, but uh, unfortunately we looked at the four digit after the decimal point, so slightly worse. Um, so I think uh, two interesting questions here. Um, one more broader question is, uh, can transformations with dependencies actually help with other problems? Because the technique of transforming the solution and then doing something was used in many problems, uh, even in the literature, uh, and it's not clear whether once you look at transformations that include dependencies, you might get better results or simpler results. And the second question, which is more specific, is actually the geometric problem I described. Uh, given the k-dimensional simplex, what's the best uh, cut density you can get for it? So we know it's at least 1.2 and at most 1.296 something. Uh, so thank you. Well, Anupam is setting up. Uh, so, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I believe there's a bidirected uh, relaxation for this problem, which is. So the input is undirected, so I'm not sure. <coughs> you mean the what I call the CGR relaxation? No, no, no. Another one. Due to the form multi The way it's weaker than CGR. Oh, is it? So, yeah. mm -hmm. is there any possibility of doing some computational things for as k gets bigger to kind of get a sense of the value of uh, uh, best alpha you can get? So, uh, so are you referring to uh, what's the best cut density as k increases? So for, so for three terminals, the problem is known. Uh, but for even for four terminals, it's not known what the right constant is. But uh, okay, this talk we focused on when k is large, let's say uh, not on. So all the algorithms here actually save, shave some factor that depends on k. I did not mention that because I didn't want to go into all those details. Uh, but um, yeah, so there are actually two types of questions. One of them is what happens when k is large, the asymptotic behavior, but even uh, as the getting the right cut densities, k increases, uh, it's not clear even for four terminals what the right answer is. Divine right. 